All right, let's go ahead and, and begin today's uh, seminar. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rory Barnes. I'm a professor of astrobiology here at the University of Washington. It's my uh, privilege today to introduce uh, Tiffany Kataria from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, Tiffany began her career at, the, at, at Stony Brook, uh, then moved on to a PhD at uh, the Planetary Sciences Department at the University of Arizona, working with Adam Schoeman. Uh, from there, she took a postdoc at the University of Exeter in their astrophysics program. Uh, and then she moved on to uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab where she still is. And uh, today she is going to uh, give us this presentation uh, titled Understanding the Origin of Life on Exoplanets. Uh, for this presentation, I'm, I, again, I'd like to ask all of you to, to remain muted and to uh, stop your video so that uh, Tiffany can have all of the bandwidth she needs. Uh, during the presentation, if you have a, a question uh, for Tiffany, you may either uh, raise your virtual hand in the Zoom room, um, or please type it into the chat room. And if I can, I'll, I'll interrupt uh, Tiffany to, to address your question. Otherwise, um, sit tight until the end of the presentation, at which point uh, I'll ask you, anybody who has a question to, again, please raise their virtual hand, and then I'll call on you. And uh, then I'll ask you to, if you can, to turn on your video so that I, you and Tiffany can have a face-to-face -face discussion uh, to discuss uh, your question. So with that, I'm uh, gonna turn it over to Tiffany for today's talk. Please take it away. Yeah, thanks Rory. Just a time check. Um, are we 45 minutes roughly or so? Yeah, 45, 50 okay. minutes, something like okay. that. Perfect. Perfect, all right. I'll keep an eye on the time. All right, um, yeah, thanks everyone for virtually attending. I really wish I could be at UW in person. Um, having not visited the campus, I guess, um, it would have been a nice opportunity, but you know, just have to wait till next year um, when I actually um, hopefully have more results on, on the, the particular project that I'll be um, talking to you about today. Um, so yeah, so this is somewhat of a broad title and that's on purpose. Um, I'd say I'm covering kind of quite a few topics centering on origin of life in the exo uh, on exoplanets. Um, I know that that is a meaty topic in and of itself. And, you know, I could probably give individual talks on a lot of the topics I'll be talking about today. And especially to a room of astrobiologists such as yourselves, um, there are probably things I'm going to gloss over or maybe not explain sufficiently. So, uh, you know, feel free to ask uh, further questions um, and I'll point you to some um, ongoing work. All right, so let's dive in. Okay, um, so here's just a you know, high level outline. I'm honestly not a super huge fan of outlines just because I feel like the talk should speak for itself, but just to give you kind of a flavor for um, you know, what I'll be talking about today, um, kind of at this high level. And I'd say they're all interrelated. You know, really it's first the story of assessing life on earth and exoplanets and how you know, our understanding of the emergence of life on earth can really inform our understanding of life on exoplanets. Um, then I'll speak to really the meat of the talk, which is this um, ongoing project that I have with a few collaborators at JPL um, entitled this laboratory to model approach to understanding biosignatures and so I'll go into further detail as to what that all means. Um, and finally I'll close with a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, studying the atmospheric circulation or weather on exoplanets. I've become quite um, intimately familiar with uh, the power of phase curves, phase resolved observations. And so thinking ahead to, you know, what, um, what prospects there are for characterizing potentially habitable exoplanets with the same technique that's been used so um, voraciously for hot Jupiters and other um, uh, um, gas giant type exoplanets. All right. Okay, so um, just, you know, kind of center honing in here. Um, so, you know, this is a, just a picture of Earth. <laughs> it's really, uh, you know, not, nothing to write home about, but you can see, uh, or maybe a lot. Um, there's quite a lot of dynamic processes happening here, right? There's, there's weather, there's cloud formation and transport, there's um, ocean dynamics, there's surface land interactions, uh, surface ocean interactions, surface atmosphere interactions. There's quite a lot of complex um, processes that are captured on this, you know, uh, wonderful world that we call home. And so imagine encapsulating all of those dynamic processes, all of those uncertainties into a single point. <laughs> and so this is a, a, the, actually the re-processed um, picture of the pale blue dot, um, the Carl Sagan um, pale blue dot, very famous. Um, and so uh, reprocessed in recent years. And so, you know, you can see Earth here, um, uh, projected out from um, the edge of the solar system. And so, you know, this is actually a more favorable case of what we're kind of faced with when you think about characterizing life on a distant exoplanet. You know, in, in essence, this is actually more angular resolution that we get with an exoplanet, right? 
And so, but this at least gives you a flavor for, you know, the challenges for trying to encapsulate all of these dynamic processes that you know is present on Earth, but trying to untangle all of those processes in a, a remote detection, um, a remote observation. That's, that's really the challenge here at the heart of exoplanets. And so before I dive right in, I just wanted to make sure I know, um, given the, the uh, group of folks on the line, um, you all may not be super familiar with exoplanets, but just to give you kind of a high level primer here. Um, so exoplanets, of course, oops, I'll go back a slide. Um, oh, goodness. Okay, hold on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Exoplanets um, are planets beyond outside of our solar system. And so I'd say, you know, broadly speaking, we're really in an era of, you know, not only detecting exoplanets, um, but really characterizing their atmospheres. But I'll go a bit into these detection techniques first. And so here are um, uh, two animations showing two of what I would say are kind of the major players in terms of detection techniques for exoplanets. And you can see um, we're now in an era of over 4,000 confirmed planets. This is, of course, due to quite a um, few of these uh, large-scale surveys, our radial velocity surveys, transit surveys in particular. So radial velocity, of course, you're indirectly inferring the presence of a planet from the, intera the gravitational interactions between the planet and the star. And so then you can infer uh, the planet's mass um, because the, the, a more massive planet will exert a greater um, gravitational interaction on the star and uh, vice versa. Um, this complementary technique, I would say, is, is the transit technique. And so again, it's another indirect technique where you're monitoring the brightness of the star over time. Um, and if a planet is passing in front of the star along our line of sight, um, you can infer that that planet's there. Um, bigger planets will block out more light. Smaller planets um, will block out less light. And so you're then... Um, uh, you have the radius or the size of the planet in hand. And so if you have the mass, you have the radius, you can start to really um, tease out the, the interior structure, the density of the planet. Is it a rocky planet like Earth? Is it a gas giant like Jupiter? And so, uh, you know, largely speaking, due to Kepler and, and now the, the um, test surveys, uh, there have been quite a few transiting exoplanets found. And so that's kind of where my head lives in, in a lot of contexts. Um, but, you know, I, I would say let's look to the future. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to highlight these two major techniques um, in particular because they'll be um, featured um, as part of the Nan Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, or Roman Telescope for short. Um, the microlensing, which is a, a um, utilizes the, the um, uh, microlensing um, lensing of a planet um, that passes in front of a star. Um, so if you capture those lensing events, you can um, monitor the magnification of the star over time. Um, this technique is, is insensitive to the size of the planet, the mass of the planet. So there have actually been very small planets that have been detected using this um, technique. Um, but really our you know, end goal, I would say, is, is using direct imaging, which is a technique that's been used for a handful uh, to detect and characterize a handful of um, giant planets to date. But this is really where we're looking forward um, in characterizing um, Earth-like planets around sun-like stars where you've got this large angular separation. And so the basic idea for direct imaging is you're blocking out the stellar light to um, reveal the presence of a planet that's orbiting that star. And so um, the Nancy Grace Roman or Roman telescope is uh, going to conduct this large microlensing survey which should tell us a lot about the census of planets that are out there. Um, Tess and Kepler have really accomplished that for nearby systems. Um, w, uh, w first, <laughs> the Roman telescope will do that for uh, a wider swath of planets. Um, and then also this very important, I think, um, technology demonstration of direct imaging of um, giant exoplanets. And I'll go in a little into why that's really, in my opinion, so important. Um, but really fundamentally, it's about you know, using the lessons learned in characterizing giant planets to understanding smaller ones. So this is my kind of primer high level overview. If there's something related to exoplanets that you have a question about um, that you want me to clarify later, I'm happy to answer that. Okay, so what are the big questions um, in exoplanets? So this is kind of how I see it. Um, you know, these, these uh, at the highest level, where did we come from? How are we alone? Um, but these are kind of the two broad topics that I would say I'm particularly interested in. Um, the weather and climate of exotic worlds, and then the habitability, habitability and biogenic gases. And in some sense, they can be interrelated, right? But they don't have to be. 
Um, and so if you know me, you know my research, um, most of my research has focused, I would say, on the former um, topic, uh, weather and climate of gas giant exoplanets in particular. And so taking simulations, taking models like the um, for hot Jupiters, um, these are three dimensional general circulation models um, that model the atmospheric dynamics on a sphere fluid dynamics on a sphere. Um, so you can take that, apply a model to um, a particular planet, in this case, the hot Jupiter WASP 43b. Here we've got a latitude longitude map um, with some wind vectors pointing to the overall wind field. Um, so we can take those models and then try and um, uh, and use those to interpret um, space-based, ground-based data. And so in this case, um, using this particular model to interpret um, wide field camera three observations with Hubble. Um, these are uh, phase curve observations, so measuring the emitted flux from the day side of the planet to the night side of the planet. I should say in this case, these are transiting tidally locked planets with permanent day sides, permanent night sides. So similar to the phases of the moon, you can um, back out exactly what longitude of the planet you're seeing as a function of, of orbital phase. And so, you know, comparing the black, which is the data, to the red and blue, which are um, uh, models of different um, atmospheric metallicity, so the, the metal richness of the atmosphere, um, you can see that the day side of the planet is fairly well matched um, by these models, um, but we're over predicting the night side flux, probably due to clouds. And so it's these sorts of exercises that tell us what's the missing physics that's at play. And so, um, uh, for giant exoplanets, that's kind of been my focus, and I'll talk a bit later in the talk about how we can apply these same methodologies maybe to start to infer things about terrestrial exoplanets. But at the Q&A session, if you want to ask specifically about um, gas giant exoplanets, happy to answer those questions too. All right, so that's, you know, kind of my, my main day to day, but the topic I want to talk to you about today, um, and this was uh, aptly put by my collaborator Lori Barge at JPL, is um, the understanding of Earth life to help us un search for life elsewhere. Um, she thinks of it actually mainly in the context of solar system bodies, you know, like Europa and, and Mars and Titan, um, but the same could be said of exoplanets, right? Um, so here's just a, an image of um, some cyanobacteria. And so um, this is just illustrative of the fact that all um, bacteria, simple life requires energy. In this case, um, photosynthesis, converting carbon dioxide and water to glucose and oxygen. Um, um, and so the same energy argument could be made um, in the first life on Earth. And so I'd be remiss not to mention um, the lost city here, which was discovered actually by UW. Um, and so these are a series of hydrothermal vents um, that were um, discovered on the seafloor. And so um, these are particularly dynamic, very chemically rich environments um, that exist on Earth today. Um, but you could imagine in an earlier scenario that's perhaps more iron rich, um, these hydrothermal vents likely existed, but likely existed in the context of a very different chemical environment. Um, and if we think then about the uh, ancestral community of primitive cells, these are some figures from Lori, um, as, as we consider life that evolved from a bil billions and billions of years ago that has since evolved into these many branches, um, it's likely that a lot of these kind of originated from the same um, energetically um, uh, same families. And so one could consider early Earth, which was in itself a different planet um, dynamically, um, chemically, um, but considering these same energy sources and the, the, the idea that life really prefers, um, uses energy in, as, in any way that it can get it, really, right? Okay, so um, finally, I'll just, just to provide some, some kind of high-level context here, um, things I think about, uh, things that Lori thinks about. This is another slide from, from her. Um, that Earth and its life have evolved together. Um, if you consider the history of the Earth, this cartoon here shows not only the history of Earth in terms of its eras, but also um, noting you know, the earliest start of photosynthesis where the Earth becomes oxygen rich and it um, enters this first snowball Earth state. So all of these processes are tightly coupled. And so that's why this, you know, from my perspective, from Lori's perspective, um, uh, you know, searching for life elsewhere requires this combined, you know, multidisciplinary approach. It really requires planetary science, you know, geobiology, chemistry. Um, she doesn't mention, you know, astrophysics in the case of exoplanets, right? It's very much a multidisciplinary perspective um, to understand how life might arise on an exoplanet. Um, I'll also note the history of life on Earth is also the history of oxygen, right? The rise of oxygen is, is very much um, coupled within um, 
the, the rising of the, the first um, bacteria and simple life. And so um, if one wants to consider the emergence of life, perhaps on an exoplanet, maybe oxygen is, you know, a fundamental ingredient for that. So what would this timeline look like on another world that may be chemically different, um, evolving through time? So these are kinds of seeds of, of things that I'm uh, thinking about in, in um, constructing uh, the project that I'll, I'll talk to you about today. Um, but before we get into that, let's just take even a kind of further step back. And so, um, you know, the, the challenges and opportunities that are afforded by identifying uh, identifying biosignatures, and I'm using biosignatures broadly here, um, I'm not adopting any particular definition um, here, um, but just thinking about uh, the fact that biosignatures that you would detect in an atmosphere of an exoplanet, right, are really tied to your local surface biology. And so let's just walk through this kind of thought experiment here. So you've got some local surface biology, and this is um, some real, real um, field, um, field information from uh, my collaborator, Scott Pearl. Um, you can see the different communi the communities of bacteria are represented by these different um, colors uh, you can see in this, in this image. So that's different local surface biology near a marine environment. And so if we think about a you know, planetary science mission, right? You can, if you infer that there's some local surface biology there, you'd send a, send a probe there, send a lander there. Um, planetary science, you'd launch a rocket to a faraway planet and make some in situ measurements, be it uh, methane on Mars, be it, you know, <laughs> phosphine on Venus. <laughs> um, and you, you'd have the benefit of the con context of the environment that you're in um, for making that measurement. Think instead of astrophysics, where we're really um, limited to remote telescope observations, right? These are distant planets, distant atmospheres, global average measurements. These are, this is the challenge we face um, with, with exoplanets in particular. And so we really rely on these remote detections of biosignature gases. And so this is just a simulated um, spectrum from uh, the Origin Space Telescope, one of the uh, large mission concepts for the um, uh, astronomy and astrophysics 2020 decadal. Um, so here are just an array of different molecules that might be present on an M dwarf, um, M dwarf planet atmosphere. And so, you know, we ideally obtain a really nice spectrum like this and, and point out and say, okay, there's water there, there's ozone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, we're really limited to these mostly global conditions, whereas in the case of, you know, planetary science, Earth science similarly, right, um, we're, we're largely limited to, or we're, we're afforded these both local and global conditions and both in situ and remote measurements, right? We're still making remote measurements as well, but you can also send a probe or an orbiter um, to, to confirm whatever you might have globally detected. Whereas in the case of astrophysics, you're really only limited to these global conditions. You're not really getting at these kind of, um, you know, small areas and trying to understand what biology might be happening there. Um, and they're, of course, only remote measurements, nothing really in situ. We're never going to really go there, sadly. <laughs> and so, um, so considering these kinds of two pathways, um, there have been efforts to try and, you know, classify, typify um, types of potential in situ versus remote biosignatures. So this is just a nice summary table from Domingo Goldman and Wright 2016. And so in their particular study, they're, they're typifying, you know, visual biosignatures, chemical biosignatures. And so if you look at, you know, visual biosignatures, right, you could go to this planet and see life there, see cellular structures, see fossils, see artifacts. Um, chemically, maybe you'd see um, any molecular evidence, biominerals, um, just looking at this particular table here, um, column here. Um, but in comparison, you know, these remote spectral biosignatures, you know, see that large scale environmental disequilibrium, disequilibrium produces life. So maybe if you see something that's out of place, maybe that's the inference that life is there. Um, photosynthetic life, maybe you could make some inference of that. Um, geometrical structures, some techno signatures, right? Um, and so, you know, but again, you're really talking about these kinds of global um, averages. And fundamentally, if we think back to this figure, right, we're, we're meant to to trace all of this back to the local surface biology that's happening on the surface. Um, and so how do you really trace those, um, those two, the, the local surface biology to what you're measuring? 
Um, so this is another uh, figure that I really like, um, you know, just summarizing kind of the basic problem that is um, identifying life on an exoplanet. What does life produce? Can a dead planet fool us? Can there be signatures on there that we think are, are related to life, but in fact are not? Um, how do we interpret limited data? We're really limited by the precision of our data, the wavelength resolution, et cetera. And how do we quantify on our uncertainties? I mean, how uncertain are we that life was detected? How can we um, quantitatively trace that? That's a big challenge. And so um, thinking to, you know, linking um, biology to these remote observations, um, what efforts exist to kind of do that? And so this is one um, in particular that I'll highlight um, by Siegerdahl back in 2013. And so um, she sort of takes, uh, the, the paper takes somewhat of a backward approach in the sense of, you know, the hypothesis is this biosignature gas to be evaluated, be it oxygen, ozone, et cetera. And so this is just an infographic showing the overall kind of steps they went through in this particular paper. So step one was determining the gas concentration. You know, what's the pressure temperature? What's the chemistry? Compute a spectrum. Um, what minimal spectral feature do you actually need for detection? Um, translate that into a gas detection to then feed into a model. So in this case, a photochemical model, an atmosphere photochemistry model. And so then you would determine um, the flux necessary, so you're kind of backing out the flux necessary to actually make that um, detection of gas concentration. Then re relate that to a related biomass. And so using essentially Gibbs free energy minimization, um, the thermodynamic model to predict the necessary biomass that would be required to produce that, again, observable signature. So then this fundamental question being, is biomass needed to generate a detectable spec spectrum um, or a plausible biomass? And so somewhat of a backwards approach, I would say. Um, and so the work I'll be talking mainly about today, um, an effort that I've been working on with Lori, with Scott, with some others I'll mention in a few slides, um, I would say our work is very much complementary to this in the sense of um, you know, taking those kinds of two steps, but almost taking a back reverse approach, starting with the biology and working our way towards identifying biosignatures. Um, so using actual microbial um, experiments, measurements, and um, arguably more sophisticated um, geochemical models, which I'll talk about um, in a few slides. All right. So, um, so as I said, the, the title um, of this particular project, this was an internally funded um, JPL project that's been since ongoing, um, is kind of the workflow is kind of as follows. So collecting these field samples that um, I described, um, conducting microbiological experiments, um, measuring gas outputs from these particular field samples, these particular bacteria, collecting the measurements in the gas phase um, using instruments such as these, and then using that as inputs to a theoretical model to really trace what's happening at the surface to what's then detectable within an atmosphere. And so um, I'll kind of focus on the, the laboratory work first and then move on to the more theoretical um, work uh, later on. But I want to first acknowledge, you know, the main collaborators for this, uh, this arena of the work, um, which is very much a multidisciplinary effort. Um, Scott Pearl and Lori Barge, who I've mentioned a couple times now. Um, so the laboratory work side of things um, took into account selecting multiple types of bacteria. We wanted to start with, you know, the simplest form of life. Bacteria is the way to go. Uh, that's where Scott, uh, microbiologist, where his expertise lies. And so um, he was the one to select um, particular um, bacteria that would be cultured in a closed system and allowed significant growth of the bacteria over time. And so the idea would be we're selecting um, microbes uh, or bacteria um, that could uh, increase yields over a you know, measurable time frame that we could actually make meaningful measurements. You know, it's not going to take forever for an appreciable amount of the colony to have reproduced to make those measurements. Um, so this is just a kind of cartoon showing this, you know, the overnight inoculation of the experiment begins. Um, the experiment starts um, maybe a couple generations later, and then um, after a couple of doubling times, then you make the measurement of what, what gas is output from the bacteria itself. Um, and so uh, given that it's a closed system, we can actually, um, you know, all the gas is maintained in the chamber to be later measured um, with, with um, these sorts of instruments. So um, I, I said that the microbes were carefully selected, right? We, we, choose, we chose these um, microbes based off of three criteria. Um, so kind of as a first, first blush into 
um, you know, validating this kind of methodology overall, right? Um, so we chose three different um, terrestrial exoplanet climates or bacteria that would be representative of these climates. Um, so something that was fairly generic, something that would, you know, could be found in really lots of environments, something that might be more um, relegated to a rocky world or a terrestrial world or something that might be more relegated to a water world. And so those um, ended up being E. coli, um, Bacillus subtilis, and Vibrio harvei. Uh, that's my attempt to read uh, uh, bacteria in Latin. <laughs> um, so each of these are also known to produce um, biogenic gases, so things like oxygen, nitrogen, methane, and um, have doubling times that are on the order of hours. And so therefore, we can repeat this um, experiment um, with a control group in, in other scenarios um, and expect fast um, enough uh, bacteria to have um, outputted gas to be measured to be a measurable quantity. Um, so E. coli, you know the one, <laughs> um, it, as I said, generic environment analog. Um, Bacillus subtilis is uh, a bacteria that's found in soil and gastrointestinal tracts of humans and herbiv herbivorous uh, mammals. Um, and finally, uh, this Vibrio um, bacteria is actually bioluminescent and found in marine environments. So you can kind of see we're playing with um, not only differences in environments, but to some degree um, differences in temperature uh, maybe that they, they might have their optimal growth. So these are doubling times are listed for optimal growth um, conditions. Okay, so um, I should preface this by saying, <laughs> you know, we put this proposal, you know, started this effort together, um, our whole collaboration, um, and then the pandemic happened, right? <laughs> we were in the second year of essentially this funded work, um, and then the pandemic happened. So I should say that, you know, we <laughs> did not make nearly as much progress, particularly on the laboratory side as we would have hoped. That being said, um, you know, our, our uh, methodology has been validated, um, which is which is promising. And so, as I said, all bacteria were cultured overnight to grow to this um, large cell concentration, so we could actually um, make sure that there are measurable quantities there. Um, and so, as I had outlined earlier, um, the idea was to make measurements after the doubling period was reached, but um, it was actually decided to do the measurements at the beginning of the experiment, the end of experiment, and then if we needed some finer time resolution, then we could make additional measurements. And so um, these histograms on the right are just showing these initial gas measurements um, for the three uh, bacteria. Um, so I've listed them all here. Um, and so the histograms, note they're slightly different in each of them. <laughs> um, so here the, the blue and orange and gray are shown for the different gases that are emitted. So in each case, um, it's oxygen and nitrogen. Um, so the, the inlet was measured at the beginning, uh, 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. Um, in these, you can see the inland uh, measurements are made at different times. Um, but all of this to say, they're measurable quantities of the gases. We see oxygen, we see nitrogen, um, maybe a little bit of methane, but there, there's gas volumes there that we can measure over time. So this really just at least gives us confidence that um, our, our experiment process, our standard operating procedure is successful. So, um, and we can, uh, again, given this is preliminary work, we can guess that the gas species are gonna influence, the different gas species will have different metabolisms. Um, and so that's probably contributes to, to some degree to the volumes of the gas that we're measuring here. And so again, on the laboratory side, perhaps not as far along, um, but we're still um, uh, pushing forward <laughs> despite all of that. And, uh, and so the next steps really are to uh, measure the gas outputs for the different types of bacteria. So we're only showing here oxygen, nitrogen, methane, but there are probably other gases present that the, the bacteria are giving off. And so um, our group has a gas chromatograph to make those, um, to make additional measurements for these bacteria to start and uh, identify some of the other gases that may be emitted um, that, you know, we could then feed into a theoretical model. And so um, having the higher temporal sensitivity, higher uh, and, and resolution. Um, and so uh, our initial project had also um, intended to look at not only um, bacteria colonies, so single bacteria colonies, but then also uh, microbial soils, which would have an array of bacteria, an array of gases that would be emitted. But of course, we have not gotten to that yet. And so um, that's also um, next on the list once um, the bacteria measurements are, are done. Okay, just looking at the time. Great. All right. 
And so now I'll just move into discussing the kind of second half of the project, um, which is on the an area I'm slightly more familiar with, uh, the modeling work. Uh, so I'll acknowledge here um, two of my other major collaborators on this project, um, Pin Chen and um, Yuck Yang at, at JPL and Caltech, respectively. And so they had embarked on this journey <laughs> to create what's called this atmospheric rock, rock ocean model um, in the context of solar system bodies. Um, but it was really this effort that moved it towards generalizing it for, for exoplanets. Okay. All right, so um, here's just a, a kind of brief overview of the uh, AROC model or the atmosphere uh, rock ocean chemistry model. Um, and I've acknowledged the full really suite of collaborators here. So not only Pin and Yuck, but um, with in particular on the modeling side of things, we've really had the um, great joy of working with quite a few um, summer interns, year long interns that have really helped further um, this model development along. So Danica Adams, who's a graduate student at Caltech, um, Skylar Dick, who's an undergrad at Caltech, um, Miranda Lee, an undergrad at um, Columbia, and then Catherine Zheng, who's uh, an intern at Yale. And we actually just have another intern that'll be starting um, from Howard University. I'm, I don't know her name offhand, but we only just got the paperwork through today. So very exciting that, you know, we really had quite a lot of momentum in getting this model developed. Okay, so um, AROC couples an aqueous geochemistry code um, developed at the USGS, it's called FREAK-C, um, and a photochemical code, so they're asynchronously coupled essentially, um, to trace surface and atmosphere um, chemistry. And so FREAK-C uses a multi-phase equilibrium chemistry in this ocean rock atmosphere system. If you look on their um, website. There's quite a lot to unpack there. They have quite a lot of chemistry in here. And so that's what I was talking about if you compare this to the Seeger et al. Um, study, uh, whereas they're using kind of simple thermodynamic arguments, which are, are all well and good. Um, this particular model really delves into the chemistry of the ocean rock um, interfaces itself in this particular closed system. And so then those are used as sources and sinks to um, kinetics, which to those uh, kinetics is a fairly well vetted um, photochemical code. Um, Mike uses it, who's on the line, plenty of others. Um, it's been used for a range of solar system planets, exoplanets, um, well vetted uh, model. And so um, those two are asynchronously coupled to trace this gas exchange from the surface um, and interacting with the, the land via weathering um, and anything that might rain out of the atmosphere that could then feed back as a source to, to freak C. And so this is really the, the main coupled approach. And then of course with kinetics, you can account for um, any gas that's escaping to a space. You can um, bombard it with any sort of um, UV uh, radiation. So you can, anything, it's kind of the kinetics is at the top boundary, freak C is at the bottom. And so in the context of the, and, and um, I'll say that, you know, ultimately, right, the goal is to then um, uh, couple kinetic or uh, use the results from kinetics, whatever chemistry comes out of kinetics, and then feed it through a radiative transfer code to come up with some simulated spectra, really the ultimate goal, right? And ultimately, um, what we'd like to do is have these biogenic gas measurements that I had described in the previous slide as another source to this overall system. Um, but right now, you know, for the purposes of what we've been doing so far, we've really been working on these independently, um, but together. Uh, and so in the case of AROC and its modeling work, we've been focusing mainly on Earth's um, uh, great oxidation event or GOE. Um, and so really meant to replicate this kind of great upheaval in, in geochemical forces, um, you know, major event, um, major source of oxygen and see what that means for this system in the context of, say, um, in Archean Earth. And so, um, you know, this, the GOE itself is poorly, uh, arguably poorly understood on Earth. And so, um, you know, ex understanding the GOE as a fundamental concept more <laughs> uh, can really help uh, our understanding of understanding um, life on exoplanets. So again, understanding the rise of Earth life can really help inform um, understanding the rise of life on exoplanets on distant worlds and how that might grow on a global scale. That's an important point because of course, again, we're really relegated to global measurements in the context of exoplanets. Okay, so um, again, breaking it down further, um, in, in wanting to create this coupled uh, model, we wanna really make sure each of the components are validated for, for modeling exoplanet, terrestrial exoplanets. Um, but again, starting with this Archean Earth um, construct. And so first, um, two summers ago used um, Freak C to uh, create an Archean Earth ocean rock system. And so in this, for Freak C specifically, um, 
uh, increasing the amount of oxygen in the system. So, uh, and then letting the system reach thermodynamic equilibrium. And so this oxygen gas is really a proxy for any biological gas that might be present in the system, but oxygen seemed like the obvious place to start. Um, and so uh, these two plots on the right, again, uh, as I was saying earlier, you know, summer interns have really helped uh, propel this project forward. So these are two plots from uh, Miranda Lee. And so on the top here is the partial pressure for um, a, few, a few of these uh, molecules in, in Freak C um, with increasing partial pressure of oxygen. And so you can see how they vary with increasing partial pressure of oxygen. And so you can see H2S drops off um, significantly. Everything else stays fairly constant. And so this decrease in H2S um, stands in stark contrast from the rest of the gases. And so then if you look at the um, amount of sulfur in solution, also decreases. And so the inference then is that the oxygen is being um, sequestered into barite, B -A -S -O, B -A barium SO4. And so this all traces chemically with what's happening in the, the whole of the atmosphere. And then once you start to plot the partial pressure of individual species, that starts to tell you the story of where the oxygen is going. So again, this is illustrative, but at least gives us a flavor for, you know, our setup is working um, and that um, we can start to explore um, different scenarios with that. Okay. Uh, and so the second piece, modeling the RT and then with kinetics. Kinetics is, as I said, a you know, well-vetted code, but um, nevertheless, um, entering some of these uh, more biologically relevant um, territory requires some um, validation and testing, nevertheless. Always good to validate your models and when you, whenever you use it in a regime that you haven't before. Um, and so this um, particular uh, setup, um, which I should say was really motivated by uh, Skylar, Skylar Dick, the undergrad at Caltech, um, she really helped sort of drive this project forward, um, incorporates uh, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur chemistry, um, quite a wide array, um, including sulfur outgassing. So kind of linking these two together, right? You see sulfur mentioned here and in the in Freak C. Um, we're using a warmer surface temperature than what's presently on Earth trying to simulate again um, our key and earth conditions, um, assuming a one bar atmosphere that's predominantly nitrogen. And so again, we're still in the, the kind of benchmarking phase here, um, but we're really trying to um, benchmark our model against state of the art models that exist out there. And so this particular um, study by, by Lou et al, which is the, the Harman casting um, heritage of models. And so here on the right, I'm showing a plot from Catherine Zhang, one of our interns. Um, and so the solid lines are, are her outputs from kinetics and the dashed lines are the outputs from, um, from uh, Lee et al, Lou et al, sorry. Um, and so you can see there's quite a lot of disagreement so far. Um, we're, we're trying to work out those discrepancies, um, but they're probably due to just, you know, differences in assumptions. So um, maybe a different um, stellar age that we assume versus what Lou et al. assumes, um, different oxygen um, photolysis rates. And so these are things to investigate. Um, and so we, the team, are, are currently communicating with, with Dr. Liu to resolve any of these differences. And so once we finish benchmarking that, we can start moving forward with confidence and, and coupling the two. Okay. All right, so here's some uh, you know, future work. Um, so this is really the whole array of the project. Um, so from the laboratory side, um, I mentioned you know, measuring the full suite of gas outputs from the bacteria. I only showed you a few. Um, there are quite a few more that we can measure with the gas chromatograph. Um, conduct these microbial soil me measurements, which I also mentioned earlier. Um, and and you know, in my mind, there's quite a lot of potential to simulate other environments, right? You could imagine, um, emerging microbes in, in the context of other environments, and how that might have contributed to um, the rise of life or, or the detectable on these different types of environments. So for example, in the context of say an ancient Mars atmosphere conditions, you know, would methane variability have changed the presence of life on Mars in the context of you know, having small microbes there um, early on in the Mars's history? Um, in the case of Europa, perhaps, um, the interaction of the ice and ocean in, in Europa, um, if you consider maybe their biological gases there by hydrothermal vents or something else, um, would those be injected into uh, ice plumes? Could we detect those um, from these planets? And so the um, actually that, that latter bullet point we're starting to do in the context of um, uh, Lori Barge and Scott Pearl's lab, um, they also grow hydrothermal vents um, 
analogs in the lab and starting to look into how biology might play a role into what, um, what chemistry um, gets output. Okay, so then on the, the, so that's the laboratory side of things, which is, you know, rich in and of itself, right? Um, and then on the modeling work side of things, there's a port, quite a lot to do. So um, benchmarking, um, once that's complete, then we can start to fully couple kinetics to the rest of AROC um, and apply AROC to um, simulate hydrogen escape. There's many different things that we could um, start to investigate, uh, atmospheric rock ocean chemistry, how they alter the atmospheric oxidation state. I think that's been an outstanding question that we've been really curious about. Um, and of course, incorporate those biogenic gas measurements that I was just mentioning earlier as sur actual surface fluxes, right? So removing that dashed line and making that part of the real thing. And so, you know, that, that requires somewhat of a conversation, right, about um, how do you scale whatever gas measurements you make um, within a bottle to a global scale on a planet? Um, how do we represent that um, accurately? Um, or as accurate as we, as we can make it, or as representative as we can make it. Um, and then, of course, the final step being to compute simulated observations, right? It's all well and good to do the modeling and the lab measurements, but we're, what we really are interested in is to what degree any of these gases can be measured um, from, or gas volumes can be measured um, from spectra, from phase curves, et cetera. Um, and so we'll probably, we've been toying around with various rated transfer models. I think Picasso is probably going to win out um, this open source code that Natasha Battaglia has developed, um, well vetted, well um, benchmarks, um, lots of good tutorials, et cetera. So that's probably where we'll embark. But I will say overall, you know, this project is very much in its infancy. And so for those of you on the line who have ideas about different applications, different avenues, we can take this particular, um, you know, pro um, project system, you know, I'm all ears, I'm happy to hear your ideas. Okay. Um, and so I just wanted to close this section. Um, and I know I, yeah, okay, I've got about, yeah. I think I'm good on time. Um, but I'll just say, you know, uh, in, in having some meetings this morning, this actually came up both times. And so I really thought it was an interesting or an important thing to bring up is that, you know, there are really, and, and you on the astro, astrobiologists on the line probably resonate a lot with this. There are lots of benefits to a multidisciplinary con collaboration. And so I'll say this project came, came about really organically. Um, I included this little schematic here of these kinds of interactions we had. Um, but ultimately, it's really these chance meetings, these informal interactions that turned into this real collaboration. And so you know, I went to undergrad with Scott. Um, I met Lori at a party. <laughs> I, you know, PIN uh, works largely in exoplanets these days. And so we had interactions. And um, in particular, you know, Scott and I had quite a lot of initial conversations about what it meant to what it meant to be a biosignature in a my, you know considering a microbiology community um, or uh, you know an exoplanet community and so once we got to talking you know it was very clear that we define things very differently we have different assumptions um, and that you know even within our own subsets of communities people don't agree and so this is really how um, the project started to come together to really trace what we understand about microbiology um, surface biology into what you know this this more global realm of obser remote observations and the context of exoplanets. And so it was really gratifying to have this whole team come together kind of organically. Lori and Scott run this lab together already. Yuck and Pin already collaborate on kinetics and the AROC model development, as I was describing. Um, Yuck kind of knows quite a few people, so I already knew Yuck. And so, was, you know, it was a really nice confluence of, of collaborators um, into this, um, what I think is a successful um, um, project so far. Um, but ultimately, I would say we really benefited from just having you know, different conversations, hearing from different perspectives. I think we have a lot to learn from each other. And so, you know, the benefit or benefit, <laughs> one thing that's kind of come out of the, the pandemic, right, is uh, obviously we have to meet only virtually, but even in those virtual meetings, we're still kind of moving a pace with having discussions, kind of positing future ideas, um, you know, um, just asking each other questions. And so, you know, I'd say largely speaking, like PIN and uh, Yuck and myself kind of fall more in the modeling, more of the atmosphere chemistry dynamics realm. And Scott and Laurie are over in, you know, the microbiology origin of life, you know, a lot of laboratory experiments. And so, you know, very much, um, largely speaking, different perspectives. And so it's been really valuable just to have conversations and talking to each other and, and synthesizing our ideas. And so, you know, the opportunity to have these ongoing 
um, conversations, hear from these multidisciplinary perspectives, I would say, you know, hold just as much value as the results themselves. I think there's a lot of good that's going to come out of this project, but I think, you know, the true value, I think, in the long term is really these interactions we've had with each other. And maybe that sounds corny, but um, it really resonates a lot with me. Okay. So I think I've got, let's see, yeah, okay, I'm at 45. I'll just close out. This stuff I can kind of blaze through, um, but I just wanted to, um, you know, think think ahead to, you know, I, I've talked kind of in, in um, an abstract sense about, you know, what we could do, um, but ultimately it comes down to what the observations will tell us and what the instruments um, will have available, the models that we'll have available. And so all I'm just showing with this cartoon is that, you know, with hot Jupiters, we can kind of, we kind of know what's going on. You know, we know that they're predominantly hydrogen and helium. We know um, in the particular case of hot Jupiters, they're tidally locked. We can kind of utilize that geometry to kind of back out what we think we know about these atmospheres. Um, but as you move towards different types of planets, um, you know, brown dwarfs, I would argue, are even more complex than hot Jupiters because of their, you know, um, variable rotation rates or, or faster rotation rates. Um, but ultimately, you know, exo-Earth, right? If we want to find an Earth 2.0, there's, there's so much discovery space, so much parameter space to explore. And so we really need not only our observations to accommodate that, but also our models and our understanding and our, our pipelines. Um, yeah, I don't want to belabor this. Um, so let me just, I'm going to skip. Um, James Webb might be able to do some identifying of biosignatures. This is for TRAPPIST-1F, um, but it's going to be really hard um, is, all, is all I'm trying to articulate here, depending on what the atmospheric type is. And so, you know, until we understand the noise sources, we won't really understand what's going on. Um, and so phase curves, you know, I would say are very much a complementary approach. This is probably not something that James Webb is going to do at the outset, but for terrestrial exoplanets, there may be some prospects for doing this for maybe not habitable planets, but moving towards at least small ones. Um, so this has already been done with um, Spitzer for some of these hotter planets, 55 Cancri E being one of them, the Slava planet, quote unquote, um, LHS 3844b, another hot, rocky thing. Um, and so, you know, this is really just giving us a taste for what you could do with, um, for terrestrial exoplanets. But of course, these benefit from being bare rock. And so you can kind of see the, the hot day side and the cold night side just from the, the hot rocks. Okay. Um, and so uh, with TRAPPIST-1, maybe we could probe different climates. Um, maybe we could identify um, thin versus thick atmospheres. I'm trying to get to the end here because I think I have, I, I have some points I want to highlight. Um, we can maybe start to constrain rotation rates on terrestrial exoplanets, um, maybe eccentric exoplanets as well. You'd see, imagine a different heating pattern depending on what the eccentricity of the planet was and then potentially what their rotation rate was. So maybe we could back that out from a phase curve, which is going to probe the thermal structure from the day side to the night side. Um, you could even do this for non-transiting exoplanets. So they don't need to be transiting, which is what I've kind of been describing up to this point. Um, but even for non-transiting planets, you can back out. Um, if you know the inclination of the planet, you can start to back out um, some of this thermal information as, say, a function of wavelength. Um, and so, you know, as we think ahead to future um, exoplanet missions, I just kind of want to impart some um, conclusions, some parting thoughts. Um, and so I think, you know, the search for exoplanet biosignatures is just going to completely accelerate over the next decade. Um, you know, I think James Webb is going to start to make these cursory observations, cursory search for biosignatures orbiting M dwarf, uh, M -dwarf stars. Um, I think ELTs, extra large, extremely large telescopes, other spa future space telescopes um, will we'll continue to do that. But I think this is really, you know, with James Webb being launched, we're really entering that era. And so with the benefit of greater precision, broader wavelength coverage, et cetera. And so I think these kinds of um, approaches to link laboratory measurements and theoretical models are going to become ever more important because we really want to understand biosignatures in the context of their environments. So really bridging these communities, as I was explaining for this um, particular project. Um, but I just wanted to say, you know, observations of giant exoplanets have been difficult to interpret, even with complex theoretical models. So, you know, we've thrown a, the kitchen sink at a lot of these planets and we can't really back out exactly what's going on. And I imagine that James Webb, with its additional observations of some of these um, canonical hot Jupiters, are just going to completely, you know, blow out of the water what we think we know about these planets. And so, you know, from my perspective, if it's hard enough to characterize and understand these giant exoplanets, you know, how in the heck are we going to understand what's going on with these terrestrial planets and, and look for life? And so that's why I really think that precursor missions like 
precursor missions, you, you might say, in the context of, you know, understanding terrestrial, the search for life on exoplanets. Um, you know, like James Webb and the Roman telescope, you know, they're so important um, because they are these precursors for validating these methodologies and tools. And so, you know, understanding how to reduce, um, you know, directly image planet data from space. You know, there may be systematics we don't understand. There may be uh, certain models that are required to help interpret the data. And so, you know, just understanding not only the tools themselves, but also the strategies for interpreting this data is going to be so critical for these giant exoplanets, these Neptune-sized exoplanets, but that all of that is going to help um, our understanding of, of terrestrial exoplanets and our search for life. So we really, in my mind, can't really do one without the other, <laughs> sorry to say, but um, I think they're really important. They, they're really strongly linked. Um, and so, you know, these observation and analysis strategies will be um, largely the same. So I think it's important to do both. Um, and with that, um, I think I'm at my time. And so, yeah, I'll take uh, questions. Thanks everyone. Great, thank you very much, Tiffany. Everybody, please uh, applaud in whatever way you can in these uh, COVID times. Thank you for that fantastic talk, Tiffany. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to uh, open the, the presentation up to questions. Uh, so as I said at the beginning of the uh, presentation, if you have a question, I'd, I'd like you to uh, please uh, raise your virtual hand in the Zoom room, and then I'll call on you. And if you are able to, I'd, I'd also encourage you to turn on your video so that uh, you can uh, speak to Tiffany directly. So got a couple questions already. So uh, go ahead, Mike Wong. Hi, Tiffany. Uh, great, great talk. Yeah, I learned a lot. So, you know, um, as a modeler, we know that it's relatively easy to, you know, change a model to model an exoplanet. You treat sure. the planetary parameters and the solar spectrum. I was wondering for Scott on the laboratory side, what mm -hmm. is he doing to simulate um, exo environments for the bacteria, aside from just selecting, you know, a, an aqueous marine. Sure. Bacteria. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I think I, do I have an extra slide on this? Let's see. Uh, oh, no, I don't. Okay. Maybe it was a hidden slide. Um, I, so, so there was actually, um, a this is a, the, the list of microbes that I showed you was actually a revised list. We had actually toyed around, um, if I can find it. Oh, here we are. Um, I guess that's a hidden slide. Can I still show this? Oh yeah. Um, so, um, so this was the original slide, and and the only reason I'm highlighting this is because, um, particularly for this particular microbe here, so um, Coelia, which is found in cold marine environments. And so we pick, uh, at the time we had picked a particular microbe that its optimal growth is actually in a very cold environment. And so that was our attempt to really try and, you know, simulate as it were um, growth in, in more extreme environments. And so you could imagine finding some um, uh, thermotrophs and, and other things to kind of simulate more extreme um, uh, bacterial growth in more extreme environments. And so that's kind of the avenue we've been pursuing in, in trying to extend our, our simulation space, as it were. <laughs> um, but, you know, you'll notice also here, um, so this original, I think the, the list evolved pandemic, I'll just chalk it up to the pandemic. Um, <laughs> you know, you'll notice here there are different um, gas outputs as well. And so that was another thing we were trying to explore, you know, if there are different gas volumes that are perhaps more detectable than others. Um, that was, yeah, so that was another avenue um, that we're hopefully, I mean, hopefully we'll do all of this in the future too, but yeah. Yeah, you know, it strikes me that maybe there should be another arrow in the diagram that mm -hmm. feeds back from the frequency and kinetics outputs yeah. back to the biology because maybe the gases that they produce change the pH or change the temperature. Absolutely. The and then yeah, know. yeah. And, and that's actually a big conversation that like amongst our collaboration we've been having is like how, how that's going to change the pH in the ocean and what that might lead to in terms of the survivability of certain bacteria. Mm. Um, another avenue that, you know, Lori and I have talked about in the past is looking at high UV environments for bacteria, for hydrothermal vents, um, you know, what What would a hydrothermal vent look like in a TRAPPIST-1 environment? We don't know that answer. <laughs> and so, you know, there are many different, that's why I find, you know, it's very much out of my, like, notional wheelhouse, but I find it super exciting because there are so many different avenues this project could take. Yeah, same here. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, no <laughs> next up, uh, we have a question from David Catlin. Yeah. Uh, hi there. Um, so my question, well, actually, my question was pretty similar to Mike's, okay. but 
um, slightly different. So Mike was talking about the exoplanet environment. Sure. And um, I'm, I'm sort of concerned about how you can really know that, that your microbial biospheres are going to be representative. So if you're, if you're talking about microbes such as E. coli, you know, mm -hmm. the, the coli comes from colon. So it's first yeah. identified in infant right. fecal sa samples right. um, is my recollection. And it probably doesn't really represent a planetary scale biosphere. Yeah. So I was thinking, you know, would it be, have you considered using stromatolites, which are, you know, microbial mats and communities of microbes that at least we know they existed on, on the early earth and, you know, would have populated the coastal regions. So, so maybe that would be something which is more kind of representative of a, of like a global biosphere, perhaps. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and yeah, I think, you know, the, the choice of bacteria to start was really more to validate our methodology. As you said, yeah, I mean, this is really not um, representative of what you'd actually find on a distant exoplanet, but at least is representative of the gases we might measure. But yeah, so the future work that I mentioned, and maybe I didn't make it clear enough, um, was actually to move this then into microbial mats. I think I, I said uh, microbial communities, but what I really meant was microbial mats. And so they're actually already collected samples that um, Scott has been working with. And so the idea would be to, ex you know, once we validated again this met measurement methodology, then we'd essentially do the same experiment for a microbial mat, which as you said, is more representative to the biomes you might see on a, on a distant planet. So yeah, that's part of the kind of overall vision of this project. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Great, uh, I think you have time for uh, another question if uh, anybody has one. All right, well, uh, not hearing any more, uh, let's go ahead and uh, thank Tiffany again for uh, another great talk, and hopefully we'll see her up here in Seattle someday. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Hard to clap with my fingers crossed. Yeah. Yes, oh, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks, Tiffany, and thanks, everybody, for joining. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.